Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining me for our presentation today, titled It's the Dose That Makes the Poison, the Cumulative Effect of Exposure to Hazardous Substances. My name is Paul Bryce, and I'm the Vice President and General Manager of Ansel's Chemical Solutions Strategic Business Unit, and also a member of the Executive Leadership Team. I've worked in the health and safety industry for almost 26 years now, and I'm therefore pretty passionate about protecting people especially from hazardous substances, which has been my specialist subject, so to speak, for the last 16 of those years. Hence, in addition to my day job at Hansel, I'm currently a non-executive director of the British Safety Industry Federation, and in the past have been an expert of SEN, ASTM and ISO working groups for chemical protective apparel. Today, I'll be providing you with a short insight on an important facet of protecting people from hazardous substances of the critical message and therefore aim of helping you understand why it's the dose that makes the poison. Whilst also providing context on the risk and consequences of exposure to hazardous substances and opening your eyes on how the historical methods of assessing chemical permeation could indeed be misleading if they are not fully understood. Hence, why more advanced techniques and know-how is required to ensure that adequate chemical protective equipment is chosen. Bearing in mind that such personal protective equipment, or PPE, is often the last or only line of defence for people against harm. Before we get started, I want to provide some context on Hansel, including who we are and our purpose. For more than 125 years, our mission at Hansel has been to provide innovative and effective solutions for safety, well-being and peace of mind, no matter who or where you are. This unwavering commitment to safety enables Ansel to provide protection solutions to more than 25 specific industries, protecting more than an estimated 10 million people each day. Alongside this, we are committed to leading an industry in human rights and ethical business practices, with our commitment to protecting people also extending to protecting the planet. We are committed to leading by science and data, embedding sustainability principles in all that we do, and we continue to make significant investments designed to reduce the impact we have on our environment. Everything we do at Ansel begins and ends with safety. So just how large a problem is exposure to hazardous substances in the workplace? In May 2021, the International Labour Organization, or ILO, published a comprehensive report that described the problem as a global health crisis and called for increased collaboration to reduce the inevitable human consequences of exposure to harmful chemicals. In this report, titled Exposure to Hazardous Chemicals at Work and Resulting Health Impacts, a Global Review, the ILO estimated that at least 1 billion workers, 1 billion people, are exposed to harmful chemicals each year in their workplace. Many workers, people, lose their life following such exposures not to mention the additional burden people and their families face from debilitating chronic diseases. All of these deaths, injuries and illnesses, I firmly believe, are entirely preventable. What does this mean for people in the United States? Well, as I was conducting my research for this presentation, I was taken aback that today, in the 21st century, OSHA, the United States Department of Labor, Occupational Health and Safety Administration remain compelled to cite on their chemical hazards and toxic substances homepage that many workers are unaware of chemicals that create potential hazards in their work environment, making them more vulnerable to exposure and injury. This for me is truly remarkable. And indeed, over the last few years, you will find that the failure to simply communicate chemical risks has been cited in the top 10 list of OSHA violations. The consequences of this for people in the US are pretty stark, as you can see from the screen. Exposure to harmful substances or environments led to the deaths of 642 people in 2019, which was the highest figure since the series began in 2011. 16,000 recorded cases of non-fatal occupational injuries in chemical manufacturing and almost three and a half thousand cases of lost time injuries due to chemical burns and corrosions. And of course, these are the reported statistics. And as was stated by the ILO in their 2021 report, 
statistics are often hard to come by. It depends very much on the industry, the geography, and of course the willingness for reporting to take place. So what part can we all play in contributing to a reduction in the unacceptable and at the same time avoidable deaths and injury statistics? First and foremost, we must strive for an all-in safety culture to ensure that people in industry go home safely at the end of the day, whilst doing so, continuing to do more to protect our planet. I am sure as safety professionals, you're all familiar with the hierarchy of controls. As stated by NIOSH, Controlling exposure to occupational hazards is the fundamental method of protecting workers. The concept behind this hierarchy is that the control methods at the top of the graphic are potentially more effective and protective than those at the bottom. Following this hierarchy normally leads to the implementation of inherently safer systems, where the risk of illness or injury has been substantially reduced. As PPE is the last line of defence, and as I stated earlier, on occasion the only defence someone has against harm, it is critical that met the methodologies used to determine PPE suitability as a barrier to harmful chemicals are fact-based and grounded in science. So let's jump into the heart of the topic now. And first of all, we'll start with a quick look at the basic principles of chemical protection or indeed chemical permeation. Conventional techniques for the assessment of chemical protection focus on the penetration or permeation of gaseous, liquid or solid substances through a barrier. For some forms of PPE, depending on the polymer that is used, it is also a requirement to assess a material for its resistance to degradation. Degradation in itself is a physical process. This is where the chemical has attacked or is attacking a barrier to the point that it results in the breakdown of that barrier and material such that chemical penetration or permeation could occur to a lesser or greater extent, depending on the ability of the material to resist damage due to exposure from that chemical. Penetration is a physical process whereby the chemical, again, whether it's gaseous, liquid or solid, would penetrate, i.e. move through a barring material via a hole, a pore that may be there deliberately, such as the case with microporous materials, or not as a consequence of degradation or some other flaw in the material allowing the chemical to physically pass through the barrier. Permeation, which is our main focus today, which I will therefore spend a lot of time on from here on in, happens on a molecular level, and this is a process of diffusion whereby a chemical is exposed to a barrier material and the chemical, be it gaseous, liquid or solid again, does not pass through on a physical level but on a molecular level. Traditionally, permeation testing methodologies and related PPE product standards focus on breakthrough time for the assessment of chemical barrier or indeed protection. To simplify the concept of breakthrough time, a good comparison would be look at testing the same way as speed limits for cars. A car can travel eight hours underneath the speed limit and not get pulled over. However, a car can conceivably drive for, say, 60 minutes and go over the speed limit and possibly be stopped by the police. So what is the connection to permeation breakthrough time? Well, in the US, in accordance with the recognized test methods, such as ASTM F739, if the speed at which a chemical permeates stays below the defined speed limit of 0.1 micrograms per centimeter squared per minute, then it can carry on permeating and do so with results then reported as greater than 480 minutes. And this is what you see on the screen with car number two, the yellow line. So you can see the speed limit, in this case represented in miles per hour, 60 miles per hour, where the yellow car has accelerated from a standing start, sped up to below that speed limit and continued on. In chemical permeation times, that would be reported as greater than 480 minutes breakthrough time. Now look at the red car. The acceleration was slower, but indeed that car, car number one, accelerated to greater than 60 miles per hour. Therefore, after 60 minutes, that car has broken the speed limit and indeed pulled over from the police and stopped. 
translating that back into a chemical permeation scenario, indeed, that would be reported as a breakthrough time of 60 minutes. Now let's look at the latest advancements in chemical permeation testing and assessment. I need to explore why breakthrough time and this concept of 60 minutes versus 480 minutes could indeed be misleading and somehow dangerous when it comes to assessing whether or not PPE is suitable for your specific hazard. Hang on. Wait one second. I think something's gone wrong here. So what is going on? We have apples, pears, potatoes, zucchinis. I'm reliably informed that we call them in zucchinis on this side of the pond versus courgettes on the other. Isn't it interesting how in English we debate between French and Italian? So what does fruit and vegetables have to do with chemical permeation and the, the dose making the poison? With 1 billion workers being exposed to harmful chemicals in their workplace on an annual basis, what does that have to do with fruit and vegetables? Well, the point here that each of these substances contain a chemical, many chemicals, in fact, and some of those chemicals may well indeed be toxic. The point here is that if a chemical is known to be toxic, the aim should be to minimize contact as much as possible. Otherwise, repeated exposure over weeks, months, years, or in the case of highly toxic substances, immediately upon contact could prove to be life changing, i.e. could lead to sensitivity or some form of occupational disease, which could impact your ability to work or even your personal well-being. In the worst case, life limiting or in other words, prove to be fatal. Apples contain the seeds, at least contain amygdalene, pears contain formaldehyde, potatoes contain solanin, zucchinis contain cucurbitacin. Yeah, can you say that word? I'm not sure I can. Cucurbitacin E. Uh, anyway, I'm sure someone will do a better job uh, than me. The point is, is that these chemicals are indeed present in fruit and vegetables. Chemi chemistry is ubiquitous. It is all around us. But of course, these are and can safely be consumed as one of our five a day. And again, reinforcing that key point that just because a chemical is present, it may not be harmful in the amount in which it is present. And just because a chemical has a breakthrough time of greater than 480 minutes does not mean that it is not present in a harmful amount. So let's go back to our graphs. Um, so I've talked to you a few moments ago about breakthrough time. Now let's look at the latest assessment techniques, something which we have been pioneering at Ansel for several years, which focuses on cumulative mass or cumulative permeation. In other words, the amount of chemical which is permeating through a barrier, thus providing critical information to safety professionals and industrial hygienists on the dose of a chemical that a wearer may, may be exposed to. So think back to the cars, the yellow line, yeah, remember that was the car that stayed below that speed limit of 60 miles an hour or in permeation terminology, not 0.1 micrograms per centimeter squared per minute. Whilst all that time that that car or that chemical was merely driving along below the limit, chemical in this case was indeed permeating but permeating below that limit below that line but over that 480 or eight hour period 420 micrograms per centimeter squared of that substance had indeed permeated now let's look at the red car that naughty car that speeded up very quickly broke the speed limit in 60 minutes and therefore was stopped by the police in fact, with that curve, that permeation curve, the total permeated amount was 30 micrograms per centimeter squared per minute. Now, traditionally, when you're looking at breakthrough times or chemical wall charts from many, many manufacturers, you would see 480 as green and 60 minutes as yellow as orange, caution. Now, when you think about having been exposed over a period of eight hours to 420 micrograms, Percent of a squared of a chemical compared to 30 
micrograms per square centimetre squared of chemical, and then you correlate that with the toxicity of the substance and the cumulative effect of that on you as a human being, then it may cause you to question whether or not it is sensible to get in the yellow car or the red car. So just to reinforce that concept uh, a little bit more, and I can assure you, I am not uh, endorsing speeding or breaking the law by, by any, any means. What we're simply talking about here is the risk of a cumulative effect, a dose that's making the poison. So let's look at this graph and consider this in the context of irritants. So the point being here, if you look at the x-axis of time and the y-axis being damaged, that over an extended period of time, or indeed a very short period of time, you could well be exposed to small doses of a particular substance. And for a period of time, show no symptoms, be asymptomatic. At some point, the risk is that you will reach what is known as a threshold limit, whereby the consequences of that exposure will reveal themselves. As I said earlier in the uh, I guess in some cases it could be dermatitis, in worst cases it could indeed be occupational cancer or other uh, health, health uh, scenarios. Once you've reached that threshold limit, of course, depending on the uh, symptoms that you're displaying, you can, of course, take corrective actions. You can reduce exposure by a PPE, you can reduce exposure by engineering controls or indeed avoiding the substance altogether. But argued by then, it could well be too late. And indeed, as you go forward in time, smaller exposures, particularly to irritants, could again result in a relapse. And therefore, as I said, limiting or indeed hindering your ability to work. This is known as a concept of bioaccumulation. There are many other biological phenomena and effects of continuous low levels of contact. The bottom line is if it's known to be toxic, aim to minimize contact as much as possible and consider not chemical permeation breakthrough time but the cumulative mass how much of that chemical is permeating through the barrier material so what do we want you to take from this webinar well first and foremost as stated by the ILO we're in the midst of a global health crisis with greater than 1 billion people being exposed to harmful chemicals in their workplace each year. If we're going to adequately protect these people and indeed reverse the injury and fatality statistics in many countries, then awareness and education is essential, especially on the risk and consequences of hazardous substances, as well as how to ensure that a hierarchy of control is effectively implemented. And finally, chemical permeation breakthrough times do not equal safe wear time. Expert knowledge and assessment, often beyond what you is critical to ensuring protection. And remember, it is the dose that makes the poison, the cumulative effect of exposure to hazardous substances, and indeed the cumulative mass of a particular substance that may well be permeating your chemical barrier material today is critical to ensure that adequate PPE as that last line of defense is deployed to protect your workers. So thank you very much uh, for listening. If you are interested in, in knowing more, then please contact your local Ansel Territory Manager or visit www.ansel.com. Or you could always email myself directly at paul.brice at ansel.com. Thank you again. Take care and be safe.